My name is Dominic Power and I'm a consultant peripheral nerve surgeon based in Birmingham in the UK. This talk on the surgical management of neuropathic pain is part of a webinar uh, from Osteotech in the UK. I lead a research group and some of the products featured in this talk are manufactured and distributed by Polyganics and Osteotech. Polyganics supports research funding for a number of trials within my group. I'm also the editor for Orthoracle, which is an online digital textbook of orthopedic procedures, and I have a shareholding in Orthoracle Limited. And I'm also director of the Nerve Surgeon, and this provides research, consulting, procedural training, education, and consulting to the biomedical industry in the field of peripheral nerve repair. Pain pathways are complex. The standard nociceptive pathway results in a painful stimulus being relayed through the sensory axons through the dorsal horn and a monosynaptic reflex to affect withdrawal by means of protection. Communication also occurs through the central nervous system into the spinal cord through the ascending tracks into the brainstem, the midbrain, the reticular activating system and thalamus and the sensory motor cortex. The sensory motor cortex allows localization of the pain response as well as affecting motor outputs or commands. The central connections within the reticular activating system are for heightened sense of awareness and within the thalamus for humoral or neurohumoral responses. It's important to distinguish between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is actual or impending tissue damage and it's a protective mechanism, whereas neuropathic pain is abnormal neuronal activity secondary to disease or damage or dysfunction of the somatosensory nervous system. And this can persist in the absence of a painful stimulus, or it can result in a heightened response to a normal painful stimulus. So following a nerve injury, there are changes that, that occur throughout this whole pathway. So in the periphery, a damaged nerve may side sprout. These are myelinated multiple small fascicles, and these can uh, result in spontaneous discharging or spontaneous pain. And also uh, they're sensitive to pressure or mechanical stimulation with increased susceptibility to evoked pain, both features of a neuroma. There are changes that also occur in the dorsal root ganglion with hyperexcitability and changes in neuropeptide signaling and synaptic uh, responsiveness. There are changes that occur within the motor outflow and within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And then finally, there are reorganizations within the spinal cord, such as increased sensitization of the spinal neurons. The changes continue right up into the brainstem nuclei, into the thalamus, and even within the cerebellar centromotor cortex. In the centromotor cortex, following a peripheral nerve injury, there is a change in the afferent signaling. As a result of this, there's a reorganization of the mapping of the sensory nervous system onto the cortex. And it's possible to have maladaptive cortical plasticity. Uh, and this may result in adjacent areas uh, overspilling to encompass the area where there's a loss of the afferent signaling, but also reduced interconnectivity. So an area of autonomy can develop within the, um, the sensory cortex. And this may be one of the triggers associated with phantom pain. It's also important to understand that nociceptive stimulation is protective and following a painful stimulation there's a normal response in the dorsal horn and a secondary afferent signaling into the central nervous system. Modulation of this can result in increased signaling and this is known as sensitization. And finally, in the absence of a nociceptive stimulation or in a lower threshold for stimulation, there can be extreme modification of the response resulting in sensitization. There are two main terms that are used to discuss central sensitization. One's peripheral and one's central. So in a peripheral sensitization, there's aberrant regeneration of axons, increased neuronal sensitivity, and this normally results in increased excitability, dysesthesia, allodynia, hyperalgesia, hyperpathia, and spontaneous pain. Central sensitization is due to the interchange between the axons and connectivity within the synaptic connections within the spinal cord and within the brain. There can be increased fields, there can be an over-response or hyperstimulation to an afferent stimulus, and there can be allodynia, secondary hyperalgesia, 
and these concepts of marginal hypersensitivity where adjacent areas of the skin also become sensitive even though they're uninjured and then autonomy within the somatosensory cortex driving phantom pain. Our understanding of what's happening within the brain or organisation has changed in recent years. Uh, Lundberg uh, discussed the changes that occur following a peripheral nerve injury and talked about areas of the brain that were deafferented uh, over being uh, consumed by adjacent areas such that there would be an increased cortical representation of intact uh, pathways, uh, particularly from the limbs, onto the sensory cortex. But Dr. Makin and others have now started to discuss the term of phantom pain associated with preservation of structure and function, uh, but with this lack of afferent signalling, uh, there's reduced interconnectivity and autonomy driving phantom pain in the deafferented area of the sensory cortex. And no discussion about complex regional pain syndrome would be complete without a discussion of type 2 CRPS. CRPS is a complex pain disorder. And CRPS type 2 is one that follows disordered peripheral nerve function. There are elements of peripheral and central sensitization with pain amplification. Uh, there is a chronicity to it long after an injuring agent has been removed to a peripheral nerve. There may be disturbance of pseudomotor and vasomotor function, such that there may be dry skin, excessive sweating, vasodilatation, causing red skin, or there may even be mottling and swelling and edema. There's typically trophism from disuse and from loss of normal signalling. In the hand, there may be abnormal nail growth and hair growth and coarse, thick skin. And there's a significant emotional impact with psychosocial ramifications for the individual. But this is one of the things that we should consider. Surgery may have a role in the management of CRPS type 2. Traditionally, surgeons would steer away from managing CRPS surgically but if there's a pain driver that can be reversed, then surgery has a key role to play. Now, when we're talking about surgery for neuropathic pain, one must make a huge assumption, namely that there is a peripheral nerve pathology that can be improved. And by improving this, the central reorganization associated with the, with the peripheral sensitization can also be improved, and therefore the central response can be modified. And this can be done in a number of ways. It's possible to reduce nociceptive stimulation through decompression of nerves, neurectomy, relocating neuromas, neuroma excision and reconstruction, resurfacing of a scarred nerve or peripheral nerve stimulation. It's possible to restore afferent signaling through reconstruction of a nerve gap, particularly following a neuroma excision, some form of functional restoration, either tendon transfers or nerve transfers, and the use of targeted muscle renovation and reconstructive peripheral nerve interfaces. It's possible to modulate the afferent signaling pathway. This is where implantable stimulators may have a role. And it's possible to modify the spinal cord response. And this is where dorsal rhizotomy and spinal cord stimulation also interplay. Now, pre-assessing somebody for a pain condition that may be amenable to surgical treatment is a complex process. And I would advocate repeated thorough clinical examination. Usually multi-professionals are involved, including psychologists, hand therapists, surgeons, anaesthetists, pain specialists. The patient must be brought along, and there's an element of patient education and communication needs to be clear with outlined objectives for intervention. The pain must be optimised through neuromodulator therapy prior to any surgery, peripheral neuromodulation in peripheral sensitization, and neurophysiotherapy techniques for central sensitization. Psychological support must be provided and where someone's had previous surgery, I would advocate a review of all records, primary care, surgery, anesthesia, therapy, psychology and psychiatry to try and understand the impact on the individual's life, the timing of onset of symptoms and other factors that may be contributing to the patient's dysfunction. Validated pain questionnaires and functional scores are useful to map an individual's response to treatment over time Goal setting allows uh, the patient to understand the uh, aspiration of treatment and also to measure the success along the treatment pathway. And diagnostic nerve blocks can be used to try and as, uh, assimilate and understand the uh, pain signaling pathways and where the pain driver is coming from in advance of any surgical intervention.
Nerve blocks should be performed with close supervision from the potentially treating surgeon, uh, usually done with the anaesthetic team with ultrasound and regional anaesthetic blockade. They're also used as an adjunct to any surgical intervention, sometimes with indwelling pain catheters. The types of surgery that are undertaken include decompression of peripheral nerves, neurostenalgia, which is releasing scar tissue, allowing nerve glide to be improved, and wrapping of scarred nerves or resurfacing of scarred nerves with new membranes or synthetic membranes. Neuroma or discontinuity of nerves uh, can be reconstructed and the relative use of autograft, which involves harvesting another sensory nerve from somewhere in the patient's body, versus allograft, which minimizes the risk of a secondary pain driver, should be balanced. If there's no distal nerve stump available, consider capping off the nerve, proximal relocation of the nerve, or targeted muscle renovation. But indwelling nerve catheters are essential for the perioperative management of these patients, and sometimes the patients will need an inpatient stay. How do we diagnose a neurema? Well, this isn't simple. Obviously, we can have a suspicion when there's been an injury mechanism. There's pain, which is both spontaneous and evoked, and sometimes a tether pain or neurostenalgia when stretching passively against uh, a neurema that may be stuck in scar. Usually, there's no functional recovery and a non-progressive tenel. So a tenel is elicited by tapping over the site of potential injury, and the patient reports unpleasant sensory symptoms into the cutaneous territory of that nerve. And finally, a response to a local anaesthetic block. I don't find it particularly useful to ultrasound or look for a neurema because it may be possible to identify neuromas that aren't symptomatic and also the whole process is quite uncomfortable for patients. But occasionally following a nerve block, I will use ultrasound and I'll do it myself to try and ascertain if there's a tether point. Now the types of interventions for neuroma, I term reconstructive and then ablative active or ablative passive. And this is an adaptation from Eblan and Dusik's paper in 2018. Reconstruction involves reconstructing the gap within the nerve, either after a neuroma resection or from a late presenting nerve injury. Short gaps can be reconstructed with a hollow conduit, though many neuromas do not fulfill the criteria as the gap is too large following resection. Autologous nerve graft being the gold standard for reconstruction, in the setting of nerve pain, for a non-critical functional restoration in a long-standing nerve injury, I would now uh, advocate the use of allograft. Um, I, th I think allograft is now the new gold standard because there is no donor morbidity from the individual patient. Ablative active procedures are trying to do something where the nerve has to regenerate but not into its original cutaneous territory. And this may be centrocentral anastomosis, uh, suturing the two nerve ends together, perhaps from an amputation, um, in a digit, and then a proximal crush, allowing the nerves to regrow around a loop anastomosis. Proximal relocation grafting or allografting, allowing the nerve to taper out to nowhere, end to side neurography, and then of course the techniques of targeted muscle renovation and reconstructive peripheral nerve interfaces. And this involves sensory nerve or mixed motor sensory nerves, reinnovating motor branches of. Uh, redundant expendable nerves or direct uh, implantation into denervated muscle flaps. Ablative passive procedures involve excision of the nerve and this can be a traction neurectomy allowing it to retract into undamaged tissues proximally, diathermy or crush of the nerve end, excision and implantation into muscle or bone or a capping technique and all of these have their challenges. So what I thought we'd do is do a case-based approach uh, to the management of nerve pain. So the first thing we'll be discussing is nerve tether or encasement within scar tissue. Nerves normally have a delicate membrane around them, creating a mesoneurium with vascular inflow to the nerve and paraneural tissues allowing gliding. When these are damaged, the nerve can be stenosed, compressed, and the impaired glide results in ischemia and mechanical irritation of the nerve, causing pain and sens sensation symptoms that are abnormal. Neurostenalgia is treated by careful dissection and release of the nerve from scar, starting in normal tissues, proximal and distal. Be careful dissecting retrograde on a nerve because it's possible in scar to damage nerves as they branch. It's easier to follow the nerve as it passes from proximal to distal down a limb because of this branching anatomy. The aim is to improve the nerve environment, and this can be done with anti-adhesion gels, wrapping the injured segment of nerve with collagen or some sort of 
uh, membrane, in this case a polymer vibrosorb membrane, membrane from polycaprolactone could be used. And then autologous flaps such as adipofascial flaps which can be placed around the site of injury. There is a risk, however, that new tether points can occur at the junction between the wrap and the normal nerve. There are other ways the nerve can be cushioned, and this can be with autologous fascia cutaneous flaps or with flap grafting. This is a case where a median nerve has been compressed and scarred, and a wrap can be placed around the injured segment of the nerve. And the options in this case are either a collagen wrap, uh, this is an axa guard, or some form of polymer wrap. And one of the ones that I've used has been the Vivasorb. This is a case where I have used the Vivasorb, and this is for a scarred base of a small finger. And this was a traumatic longitudinal wound which has undergone expiration and repair, and then subsequent contracture. Um, this contracture is limiting extension of the finger, so Z plasties are planned. The underlying nerve injury is tethered in scar and painful. Uh, but there is some form of protective sensation and therefore there's no plan to take down the damaged segment of nerve and rebuild it. Following exposure and neurolysis using sloop retractors, the digital nerve can be removed from the scar tissue and this is the neurolysis. And now what's required is some way of preventing this nerve from adhering again into the surgical bed. In this particular case a vivasorb polycaprolactone layer is placed around the nerve and sutured into place and this creates a temporary barrier and it gradually absorbs over a period of about 18 months but it provides a, an interposition with mechanical uh, strength and stability for a period of about three months during the wound primary healing. The suture is closed following z-plasties which lengthen the scar. Next I wanted to talk about neuroma so following identification of a neuroma, and it could be a neuroma in continuity or it could be an enneuroma, if there is a distal stump available, then reconstructing the proximal and distal stumps is essential. And this reduces, uh, reduces pain, also restores some afferent signaling back to the sensory cortex and reduces the central sensitization. Conduits such as the Neuralac polycaprolactone tube can be used in small gaps and Results are fairly good up to about 12 millimetres, but longer gaps, the results tail off. Longer gaps can be treated with allograft, so this prevents donor site morbidity. And the junctions between normal nerve and the allograft can be wrapped using connectors. And nerve autograft can be used for critical nerves, for mixed nerves and for longer gaps. And this usually involves taking a, an autologous graft and cabling it into position, suturing each end and supporting with fibrin glue. And for a large gap, usually the sural nerve would be harvested from the lower limb. Now NICE have reported on the role of processed nerve allografts in nerve gap reconstruction and they've shown that for digital nerve reconstruction the results are extremely good. They've suggested for larger gaps in sensory nerves or for mixed motor and sensory nerves enhanced governance is required with collection of quality of life measures as well as functional outcomes for patients and patients should go through an enhanced governance process including provision of written information and full discussion of the alternatives. They do suggest that the safety data is excellent and the efficacy data is extremely good for digital nerves and in registry studies and comparative studies it's uh, equivalent to autologous graft reconstruction for digital nerve in the hand. So here's a nerve that's been injured following an MCPJ dislocation and this is a large neuroma in the radial digital nerve to the index in the palm just at the, just distal to the bifurcation. Um, now at this point the nerve can be excised and it can be reconstructed using allograft. This is a two to three millimeter diameter allograft and a section is chosen to rebuild the nerve gap without any tension and it can be sutured into place. Allograft is also useful when there's been a failed primary nerve repair. In this case you can see a suture repair of an oblique laceration within the ulnar digital nerve uh, to the middle finger. Unfortunately the patient had extreme pain on gripping and on expiration the neuroma was identified and it was resected serially until proximal and distal stumps looked healthy and then an allograft or an autograft can be used to rebuild the gap.
For an end neuroma, where there's no distal stump available, this is now a challenge. Pain may continue to be amplified due to the lack of afferent signaling to the brain. Targeted muscle renovation involves redirecting this proximal stump of a sensory or a mixed motor sensory nerve into a redundant or expendable motor branch. What can happen is after neuroma resection, the functioning motor branch can be sectioned and rotated and the two can be anastomosed. And now the proximal stump will grow into the intramuscular neural plexus well away from the skin. This is a typical case and this is a patient who's had injection related injury to the CMC, uh, for the CMCJ arthritis and the superficial radial nerve has been injured. Following an exploration and neurolysis, she ended up having a capping of one of the nerve branches, but as the arthritic pain deteriorated and she became a candidate for CMCJ excision arthroplasty, uh, we elected at the same sitting to undertake surgery to try and redirect the painful nerve fibers from the scar rather than stir them up again. So this patient has previously had capping of a nerve branch. A small residual neuroma is identified and this is mobilized as part of the approach. The anterior interosseous nerve is exposed in the distal forearm distal to the branch to FPL and the motor branch into the craniofemoral quadratus is protected in a sloop. Following resection of the neuroma, a sloop is used to deliver the stump of the superficial radial nerve into the surgical bed next to the anterior interosseous nerve terminal branch, which is sectioned proximally just distal to the FPL innervation. Following sectioning, the two nerves are placed tension free in close approximation, sutured using nino nylon and then supported with tissue fibrin glue. So now the superficial radial nerve is implanted deep under the flexor muscles and tendons and then is anastomosed into the terminal branch of the anterior nerve to grow into pronata. The pronata quadratus is expendable as pronata teres is working well. This is a form of targeted muscle renovation, and targeted muscle renovation can be used for a mixed motor sensory nerve as salvage for phantom pain or neuroma pain, or in this case can be used for a pure sensory nerve neuroma. Following resection, it can be redirected into a motor uh, terminal branch. Here's another case to illustrate what happens with enuroma management. This patient was a complex ulnar nerve injury and had a primary repair of the ulnar nerve many years ago. Unfortunately, pain persisted and after a few months it was re-explored and an unrepaired dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve neuroma was identified. A neurolysis was performed with some internal neurolysis around the repair site in the ulnar nerve, but because the patient was functioning well, the main ulnar nerve neuroma was not taken down and reconstructed. And the dorsal branch, because it had been long-standing forming a neuroma, had been resected and buried into the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. However, the patient continued to report ongoing intermittent pain and spontaneous contraction of the fingers which was painful. After multiple referrals back to the parent unit, eventually he was discharged uh, and the decision was made that the patient was probably malingering. The patient continued to report symptoms for many years and after about eight years represented. Again, in the history, the patient reported spontaneous contraction of the fingers that he could not control and he reported it as being painful and there was some pain on passive stretch of the fingers. Eventually, a decision was made to explore the patient's site of previous surgery, and it was identified that where the small branch from the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve had been implanted to the FDS, there was a new neuromuscular end plate that had formed, and even with tiny stimulation, in this case, we were using 0.04 milliamps, so two and a half times the normal, below the normal threshold. There was spontaneous contraction of the FDS muscle. So for some reason, this patient had managed to get some interface develop between a sensory nerve and the FDS. Now this could either be autonomic cholinergic fibers forming some sort of end plate resulting in motor contraction, 
or perhaps it may be a Kaplan anastomosis where some of the original innovation of the ADM was taken through the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve and these were originally cholinergic motor fibres that have now formed this new end plate. However, it begs the question, implantation into a muscle can cause scar and doesn't always result in the relief of pain that one would expect. So another alternative strategy might be to cap the nerve to shield it from its environment. Following a neuroma excision, a cap can be placed, and in this case it's a polyganics neurocap. The neurocap is made of polycaprolactone and has a chamber to allow unsupported outgrowth from the nerve, protecting it from the environment, and eventually the nerve tapers and withers, and apoptosis can occur. The cap provides mechanical support for a period of about three months and then gradually disappears over about 18 months, shielding the nerve from the environment and scar tether, but not leaving anything that could cause mechanical irritation of the nerve. So this is an example of neuromas in the hand following an amputation and caps are applied over the cut ends of the digital nerves following removal of the neuromas. Now the benefit here is the nerves don't have to be stripped more proximally and this is really useful for nerves where they have a branch point such as in the second web space. And it also means that some of the more proximal branches that supply some sensation over the base of the finger and the hand can also be preserved. This is a case who's had a sural nerve excised for reconstruction of a nerve in the hand and there's a large neuroma on the back of the calf which is causing tether. My preferred technique for harvesting the sore nerve is to allow it to retract deep to the deep fascia so this sort of injury doesn't happen. But in this case, the neuroma was resected and capped. Now whether or not capping all donor nerves at the time of harvest would prevent this sort of thing happening is uncertain, but it's something to consider. And the patient went on to have good pain relief. So what happens to these caps over time? Well, I do have one case where I had to go back in for some further surgery and part of that surgery was through the bed of a nerve that had been previously capped. And what it demonstrated was that the nerve had tried to have some outgrowth but it was more controlled and a large neuroma hadn't formed and the nerve was shielded from the environment and we've published the results of this. There's also a multi-centre international study looking at the results of nerve capping and this is the PROTECT neuro trial. Patients were recruited from multiple centres around the world if they had neuropathic pain in a functional end neuroma. Their pain scores, their analgesic usage and various functional scores were collated over time and the patients were followed up for two years. The study is ongoing and the final results will be available in summer 2020. But the provisional results demonstrate good preservation of function over the first 18 months or so following surgery. Obviously many patients are still due to have their final follow-up, but visual analog pain scores are significantly improved and this is maintained over the two-year period. So this shows some of the results. In the upper limb the quick dash has been used and at screening the visual analog was 70.6 and at 12 months follow-up it was 26.5 plus or minus 29.4. So there's a preservation of visual analog pain reduction at 12 months, also a reduction in the Elliott score, which is a score for neuroma pain, and a reduction in disability and improvement in gold score. And there was also a reduction in the use of analgesic medication at 12 months. Um, in the study so far, there was a 2.7 confirmed neuroma recurrence at 12 months. Uh, and this is lower than what's reported in the literature for similar interventions. This demonstrates the quick dash improved function, so reduction in disability maintained for 12 months, and also the Elliott score. So the Elliott score measures neuroma pain using various different categories of pain and grading them zero to four. So my summary on surgery for neuropathic pain. Systematic repeated examination of the patient is required, bringing the patient on board and helping them understand the objectives of any intervention and why they have nerve pain using neuromodulator therapy, using diagnostic nerve blocks, and then prehabilitation, so using techniques to try and reduce the central sensitization using cognitive methods and also neurophysiotherapy methods. Surgery may have a role in COPS type 2. We've discussed a neuropathic pain algorithm. 
between reconstructive procedures and then active, ablative or uh, passive procedures. We've also discussed the use of allograft to minimise the risk of autologous heart nerve harvest, particularly in situations where a patient may have uh, severe nerve pain and there's a worry about causing a secondary pain driver. And then we've talked about resurfacing or cushioning a nerve to prevent scar from neurostenalgia using various membranes, including the vivisorb membrane, which is a polycaprolactone sheet. And we've also talked about the role of capping and neuromas to prevent local scar occlusion. And I would suggest that all patients perioperatively are managed with nerve blocks to try and reduce their central pain manifestations during the perioperative period. If you want more information, uh, please feel free to check out the Nerve Surgeon website and also the Instagram and YouTube for the Nerve Surgeon where some of these techniques are illustrated. And I'll just move on to a case discussion. This is a case of neuropathic pain. The soldier had a complex injury that resulted in a, a delayed amputation of his left leg. Shrapnel injuries to the right leg resulted in fasciotomies, but after a long period of time and rehabilitation, the patient was unable to stand due to pseudoparalysis. Careful examination revealed absent sensation in the superficial radial nerve, uh, sorry, in the superficial perineal nerve territory, disordered pain within the deep perineal nerve territory, a strong tunnel over the superficial perineal nerve at the uh, level of the fasciotomy, and another tunnel over the deep perineal nerve at the septum between the lateral and anterior compartments and irritation of the perineal nerve in the perineal tunnel. He requested an amputation for the right leg because he was unable to use it, so he couldn't stand to wear a prosthesis to walk on his left leg and he'd become wheelchair dependent. We brought him in and under general anaesthesia and proximal peripheral nerve uh, block, we explored the area and we found that the deep perineal nerve was stuck in scar and underwent a neurolysis, including its motor branches. The perineal tunnel was released and then careful dissection of the superficial perineal nerve revealed a large neuroma and this was capped. Following capping, a nerve catheter was placed in the proximal end of the wound and then the area was sewn up. He went on to do extremely well. His pain disappeared, the pseudoparalysis resolved and he was able to then wear his prosthesis on the left leg and return to function and is now working full time. Careful management of patients with neuropathic pain and using a structured reconstructive algorithm can really provide excellent results for patients. Many thanks for listening.